This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. Hello, and welcome to the show. With this podcast, I share a variety of stories from the most well-known dynasty of them all, the Tudors, from simple stories about the people of the time to the drama that was the reign of Henry VIII, and of course, politics. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by The Falcon Nest, handmade history-themed jewelry. The Falcon Nest specializes in gorgeous replicas of that famous Anne Boleyn bee necklace. You can find out more at the hyphen falcon hyphen nest dot com and be sure to use promo code tutors dynasty to receive 15 percent off so may 19th is the 483rd anniversary of the execution of anne boleyn i hate to call it an anniversary because that would indicate a celebration and it was no real celebration for anne except without her execution i don't believe that she would be as popular as she is today Anne's sister Mary has been mostly lost to history, but part of her still carries on today. We'll cover that more in a little bit. On today's show, we have special guest Christine Morgan. Christine is a historian and web series creator from Charlotte, North Carolina, and holds an MA in European history and has been invited to present her research internationally at history conferences in the U.S. and in the U.K. Her research covers the history of royal families, royal mistresses, religion, theater, and propaganda. Christine's web series called Untitled History Project, which she writes, researches, and hosts, has garnered support in her community and has been used as teaching material in high schools and universities in the U.S. Christine, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk about this with you today. It's so special. Well, I know that you're a huge fan of both Anne and Mary Boleyn. So what is it about each sister that attracts you to them? And who is your favorite, if you can pick one? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I can definitely pick one. I think that for me, the Boleyn sisters, my interest in them um, is kind of it marks different points in my life as a historian. I think we all start with Anne, uh, the tragedy, the love story, the the sweeping drama of it all, um, followed by this really swift downfall that no one can really quite explain. And then, um, you know, as soon as you start reading more about Anne, you see that there are different characters intertwined in her life who may have also been present at various points in her in her demise. And so I think for me, uh, I started with Anne Boleyn because it was sort of a mystery, a drama mystery. And then I switched into Mary, which I am drawn to her for different reasons. Of course, I think I'm drawn to her because no one really talks about her. And that's more so the reason I like to talk about Mary because, uh, you know, I think she has a really interesting story that people are still trying to figure out. Whereas with Anne, we are drawn to her because of the sheer drama of it all. So I think my favorite is probably Mary. That's what I based a lot of my thesis work in grad school on. Um, But gosh, you can't go wrong with either, right? Well, exactly. Both of them are just amazing to to think about what kind of life that they had. You know, Anne's, I think Anne's execution is definitely what draws people to her the most. Mm. And I feel like for me, it's Mary Boleyn's um, independence and in, in finding love. You know, that's what draws me to her. Mm. That is such a big part of her story. I think that both Boleyn's both Boleyn women did that really well. We know Anne had a secret engagement before, and then we know Mary eventually will elope. So I think both of these women show quite a lot of agency in terms of picking who they want to marry and who they want to be with. And it always ruffles some feathers, right? Oh, it totally does. You you can always be up for a good debate when it comes to the Boleyn sisters. Mm, And there's so much to talk about, too. So Um, I'm really, really excited to be here and kind of talking about their intertwining stories on this really um, rather sad anniversary of her execution. But there's a lot of good stuff that happens before this moment. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. Well, when it comes to the Boleyn sisters, um, I think most people know that we don't really know about their dates of birth, do we? Oh, this is such a good debate. (laughs) 
Um, there are even some really great uh, older historians who were going at it, you know, going for the jugular over this debate, you know, 10, 20 years ago. So it's been raging and raging. Uh, I think the only thing that we can say uh, for certain is the order of birth, which would be Mary, then George, then Anne. Uh, so in terms of who's oldest to who's youngest. But when we start talking dates, you know, it's really difficult because England didn't really require, you know, birth, marriage, baptism records until the 1530s. So if they exist before the 1530s, it's sheer luck. And we just don't have those records for the Boleyn children. And when it comes to Anne, they usually focus on either 1501 or 1507, correct? Mm, yeah, they usually do. And there are great arguments for both. I think a lot of it ends up being you have to look at where she is at different points in her life and whether or not it makes sense for a seven-year-old to be in Austria in 1513 or if it makes more sense for a 13-year-old to be in Austria in 1513. Uh, so I think for me, probably, there's a happy medium. We also know that there's some interesting ways of dating. The calendar back then was a little bit different, so some dates are, are a little bit off. But, you know, I don't know if it's 1501 or 1507, so let's split the difference and go, like, 1505. <laughs> there you go. We'll make it, make it fair for everybody, just right in the middle. <laughs> yeah, we all just agree. <laughs> you know, I feel like I tend to lean towards the earlier one, just like you said, because of the age, it seems more plausible to me for her to be 13. But, mm. we'll, you know, we don't know for certain. Yeah, we don't know for certain. There have been really good arguments about, you know, her writing skills, her French skills. I think the letter that people like to focus on in terms of trying to find her age is a letter she wrote to her father in French. It sounds like maybe the language of a child, but the skill is that of someone who's a little bit older. So, yeah, it could go either way. I think I agree with you, though. I like the earlier dating Um I find it hard to believe that she would have been executed before she was 30. Right. <sighs> yeah. It's, it's a fascinating conversation. I think <laughs> it'll one that will, it will last forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. So you mentioned Anne's time in Austria and we do know that both Mary and Anne spent time at French courts and that's where Mary picked up that awful nickname um, from King Francis, didn't she? <laughs> yeah, the uh, the English mayor incident. Um, you know, I actually think that it's difficult to determine which sister he's actually referring to there. And it's been depicted in a couple of different ways. But I think the crux of the matter is when we find out that those nicknames have been given, it's usually after the fact. And it's usually being said by someone who is Catholic. So we kind of have to look at those with a little bit of salt because it's propaganda at the end of the day. So um, in terms of the things that were said about Anne and or Mary by Francis I, we usually don't get documentation about that until, at least with Mary, until 1536. So almost, you know, 15 years after she's been gone. So how could we possibly put that on her as a truth, you know? Yeah. And, and it's kind of the same thing that happened with Anne of Cleves. Yeah. Oh, and I love Anne of Cleves. So I too. she gets a really bad um, reputation for having been ugly. I don't think she really was. I think she actually offended Henry VIII, and he got mad, and that was, you know, his go-to. <laughs> right, right. I'm currently reading Heather Darcy's um, nonfiction book oh, on good. Anne of Cleves, and it is an eye-opener. A lot of the stuff that we have learned over the years turns out to be um, either misunderstood or actually incorrect. Mm -hmm. and, and so that to me is fascinating that we can kind of see what the truth really is hundreds of years later. It's kind of exciting. It absolutely is. But it's a little bit heartbreaking, too, to think that the way that we think about these women, uh, any of them, any of his wives, any of his mistresses, so on and so forth, we kind of have to piece together this pers perspective of these women based on 
men who are writing about them either in anger or for propaganda purposes or whatever it is, uh, we very rarely see their voice anywhere. Um, so we have to do a lot of, of legwork as historians. Now, we're talking about Mary and Anne, and I know that on the 4th of March, 1522, both Mary and Anne had parts in the Chateau Vert pageant. Mary played kindness, Anne played perseverance. When did Mary and Anne each return to English court? I think at this point, uh, they're both there. For Mary, people think that she didn't arrive until 1520, you know, just in time for her wedding to William Carey. But when you look at the records, there's actually mention of two Bullen ladies having breakfast at court in November of 1519. So My assumption is that Mary has returned from France and is at court with her mother um, at least by November of 1519. With Anne, we know she's in this 1522 pageant. Then she is secretly engaged to Henry Percy in 1523. 1524, Woolsey says, we're not going to let you get married. uh, And she's sent to Hever. So I think she's at English court in 1522, but then it's really not until 1526 that we see her having, um, being pursued, excuse me, by Henry VIII. Now, after Mary's return um, to English court, did it take very long before she started to to sleep with King Henry? (laughs) This is a great question. I... So we know she's there in 1519. William Carey has just been elevated to Knight of the Body. So it's a great match for her. Um, And he's related to the king. So it's her marrying into the royal family in 1520. But she doesn't appear in this pageant um, until 1522. But when she does, she plays a really, a rather prominent role. So my assumption is that we can at least mark March of 1522 as the relationship is either about to start or has, has maybe just started. So uh, about two years. Oh, wow. Okay. I wouldn't give it more than that, but certainly she's got two years of marriage before she appears in this pageant. Interesting, because one of the questions or, I guess, debates that have gone on probably for centuries is that Mary Boleyn's children by William Carey, um, Catherine and Henry Carey, were actually the children of Henry VIII. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, this is such a fun one. It makes a lot of sense, too, when you think about it. If she had started her affair with Henry VIII any earlier, 1520, some people have suggested she's already having an affair by the time she gets married. Um which I think is is impossible. Um, <laughs> if we put her as having a, an affair in 1520, Henry's attention span is is way too short for him to have had, you know, just a, a regular affair for five years. And kind of, you know, changes the rules there. So I think for Mary, 1522 is a good starting place. And then there are children in 1524 and 1526, I believe, um, after which time I believe their their relationship ends and he switches over to pursuing Anne. How uncomfortable would that have been? <laughs> I think about that all the time. Oh, so uncomfortable. Um the only thing that kind of gives me a little bit of comfort in in this particular, you know, going from one sister to the next is that we know Henry is sort of a serial monogamist. So he's not just sort of, you know, use and then lose them. He's going to he spends several years with Mary and then he actually gives her and her children some displays of favor and attention for the remainder of Mary's life. So he doesn't just you know, drop her like a hot potato. He he sticks with her and he advocates for her and he gives her children places at court. And of course, all of those things point to him maybe being the father of one or both of her children. Well, then that, that leads me to putting you on the spot here. Do you think both Catherine and Henry were his children or one or the other? I think most likely Catherine 
would have been the daughter of Henry VIII. I don't think Henry is. Um, of course, it's possible, but when again, when we look at the records of the people who are saying that Henry is the son of the king, there those are things that are said in propaganda or things that are said, you know, in a in a speech right before someone is executed. They're said for drama. And so I think that actually makes it less credible. Um, obviously, Henry gets a lot of favor from Elizabeth I, which he would as her cousin. Um, and the two of them grew up together and were educated together. But Catherine is really interesting because as a girl, there's really no need for things like guardianship or good education or um, placing her at the at um, Anne of Cleves court, which all happened. So why is Henry VIII putting his niece in his new wife's court when she's the niece of someone that he executed? So I think that that's kind of tricky, but I think Catherine is the most likely to have been Henry's daughter. I love it. It, it. It's the constant debate, isn't it? And we'll never yeah. know for sure one way or another, but we love to talk about it. I know. My big thing is, you know, as a historian, I can't just run around asking people to exhume bodies, but <laughs> uh, I wish I could. could. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I just learned something um, yesterday, um, a fun little fact that um, – the current royals, let's say Prince William, the Duke of Cambridge, and Prince Henry, Duke of Sussex, mm. they descend from Catherine Carey and her brother, Henry Carey. Yeah, which makes them, of course, descendants of Mary Boleyn. And I love that. Yes, that's really, really exciting. Wouldn't it be fun to think that eventually the Boleyns ended up in the royal family um, and and the Tudor line is still in there somewhere. Wouldn't that just be so fun? It's amazing. I love it. I absolutely love it. And of course, we have a redheaded Harry. Um, <laughs> and his wedding anniversary is the same day as um, Anne Boleyn's execution. So it would just be full circle. Wouldn't that be great? It would. And I, I just love that they're descendants of Mary. You know, it's it seems like poetic justice in the end. I know we get this, we get this constant, you know, she's the other Boleyn girl. She's the one that wasn't as important, but oh, I'd have to disagree. I think I'm right there with you now. <laughs> so now we know in 1528, the sweating sickness was huge in England. Many people died from it. Um, Anne Boleyn happened to survive it. Uh, others, unfortunately, were not so lucky. Yes, this outbreak of the plague you know, it happens every once in a while. I, you know, we can't really explain it. We obviously know that there's, um, you know, health and cleanliness issues. But one of the people that it really affects is Mary Boleyn, because her husband, William Carey, is actually going to die uh, during this bout of the sweating sickness. And this is really dramatic, because we're still in a time period where all of those lovely annuities and lands and grants that are given to the husbands, they revert back to the crown. And it becomes an issue in a couple of different ways. Mary has nowhere to live. She has no money. She's got two children. And this is where we see the traditional practice of what we call wardship. So she doesn't have the money to support her son, Henry, anymore. Um, and because he's a boy and because Anne is now in this relationship with Henry VIII, maybe engaged to him, uh, Anne becomes the most stable member of the Boleyn family. And so little Henry becomes a ward of Anne Boleyn. And this is pretty traditional. Uh, you know, families have to take care of each other. And this is just one of those structures that's set up to make sure that kids get educated and um, get to be at court if they should be there and things like that. But um, Mary still has to take care of Catherine. And the big request, that's a really big deal. She needs somewhere to live, and she goes to her father, Thomas Boleyn, and says, can we stay with you? And in a really strange turn of events, he says, 
no, you cannot stay with me. Even though you've got this child, my grandchild, even though uh, our daughter, my other daughter is about to be Queen of England, you can't stay here. So I'm not really sure what the falling out was there, uh, but they had a really big one. Um, and so this is where we see Mary really use some agency, and she goes to Anne this sort of sisterly love, sisterly affection, please help me. She goes to Anne and requests that Henry demand that her father allow her to stay with him. Um, and he does. He steps in and he advocates for Mary, and he makes Thomas Boleyn take in his daughter and his granddaughter. Um, of course, we don't have official records of this, but that response appears in a love letter between Anne and Henry. So we know that they're communicating about Mary in their love letters, um, and then Henry is willing to help Mary. So this is a really interesting moment where we see a lot of agency and a lot of favor, but of course it's born out of this really sad moment um, where William Carey has died. And then after that point, Mary disappears for a bit, and we don't hear from her again until 1534. Yeah, she's off the record. I don't really know what happened there. We know she's with Thomas Boleyn, but she's laying low. Uh, and then, and then of course, by 1534, like you said, when we see her again, she shows up at court, and she is really pregnant, visibly pregnant. And she's married. And, and everybody's looking at her like, when did this happen? How dare you show up at court married and pregnant, especially when her sister is having trouble conceiving and her, her position is already in danger at English court. It was a, a big deal. Well, I don't know exactly what happened with that baby, though, because there's no record of a, a new baby for Mary in 1534. Which is kind of sad because she probably lost it more than likely. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's especially sad because they made a point to say that she's visibly pregnant. So she's pretty far along. I had imagined that would have been uh, just very, very distressing. Oh, that poor thing. She went through so much, didn't she? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But the bright spot, right, is her new husband. Yes, that's one of my, okay, one of my favorite things about Mary Boleyn um, is when she married um, Stafford, and then she wrote that letter to Cromwell, um, mm. and, you know, telling him about her love for him. Um, I would love it if you could elaborate a little bit more on that letter. Oh, it's such a great letter. And people read it like a great love letter, but there are a couple of other things that are really, really important in that letter. But to your point, she's been banished from court because obviously she got married without permission. And that makes Harry or Henry, Henry and Anne very upset. So she's banished from court and she writes to Thomas Cromwell, essentially asking for forgiveness. And then she gives us all these reasons why her new husband is so perfect you know she's in love with him she trusts him um she uses this phrase you know i was in bondage and now i'm at liberty so this idea that maybe she's coming out of a really oppressive situation maybe with her father um and now she has a husband who loves her and lets her be herself oh it's such a great letter i'm gonna have to share that letter i think um when i when I share this podcast with everybody, because I think it deserves to be read and reread. Mm. Every time I read it, it just moves me. Now, do you ever notice when you read it, not once in that letter, does she say that she's sorry? Oh, that's a good point. I don't think I noticed that. She asks for mercy. She asks for forgiveness. She says, yes, we did it and we shouldn't have. But at no point in that letter does she say that she's sorry. <laughs> Good for her. <laughs> I love that. Can you imagine? Um, 
And of course, the language is really important, too. I think um, I gave a, a conference paper um, in London last year all about the language of this letter. Um, and like I said, she's using words like bondage and liberty. And when we look at some of the early translations of the Bible, um, those are words that really pop up a lot in the Protestant Bible and in, in literature that has to do with the Reformation, and it's peppered all throughout. So we see not just evidence of her agency, this great love story, finally she's happy, but we also see evidence of um, the way that she thinks, and it includes a lot of reform language. Her and Anne, I feel like they were so similar in so many ways, and you said, you know, Mary was happy. At this time, her sister Anne, if we turn our attention back to her a little bit, you know, in 1534, she's now married to King Henry. She has a daughter, Elizabeth. And as time continues in her marriage with Henry, Henry starts becoming distracted, let's mm-hmm. say. Um, and <laughs> that's the best way for me yeah, to, to put it. <laughs> To put it nicely. <laughs> do, do you think that Henry's relationship with Jane Seymour is what caused Anne's downfall, or do you think it was something else? Oh, gosh. Ooh, that's a tough one. I mean, I mean, certainly, yes. There has to be a percentage in there where Jane Seymour is part of – she's maybe a catalyst. Um, the thing about Jane Seymour, too – you know, I don't think she's as meek and mild as history writes her. I think she was prepped. I think she was trained. I think she took a page out of Anne Boleyn's book and ran with it. So I think she knew exactly what she was doing, and she had already seen Anne do it. So she knew the method, right? Um and of course, by this time, Henry is nervous again about having sons. So it's kind of the perfect moment for Jane. So, yes, I think that she she is definitely a part of this. Um, but I also really like thinking about the theory that maybe Henry's jousting accident was was kind of the thing that flipped a switch in his brain. Maybe there was some damage there because we go from like January of 1536 and everything's OK and they're still trying for babies to Anne is executed by May of 1536. Um, And it just feels so fast. Like, what if there was a physical thing there? You know, I I often wonder, too, about that jousting accident. And I think I think sometimes more of it as um, Henry had a realization of how precious life was and that he could be gone tomorrow and he still didn't have his legacy. So you're going with the existential crisis of it, right? All. It just uh, seems typical Henry to me. Does it really does? He's very he's an impulsive guy. We can't deny that, and he loves you know a young beautiful woman. <laughs> he can't resist. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good interpretation of that too. I don't know that we can ever know, but I think those are all really relevant theories. Um, But sure, Jane is definitely going to play a part in this. Yeah, I definitely don't think she was as innocent as um, or, or, you know, people make her seem like she just stumbled upon this and she had no choice. I've always kind of believed, too, that maybe Jane did use Anne's method, but she revised it because she saw how it didn't work for Anne. Yeah, right. She she was able to kind of observe the whole arc of that story and say, oh, that's where it went wrong. Let's not do that. <laughs> right. And it, and it turned out in her favor in the yeah. end. And if you look at it, if you think about Jane, like close your eyes and imagine you're Jane Seymour for a second. Would you really marry a man who had just beheaded his wife 10 days earlier if you hadn't been prepared for that all along? Exactly. And she had seen what happened to Catherine of Aragon as well. Oh, Yeah. Oh, poor Catherine of Aragon. I know. That's a whole nother podcast, right? I know, I know. (laughs) So when Anne's downfall is happening, I've always wondered where Mary was during this time. Do you have any idea where she was? I really don't. I I think pretty definitively we've been able to determine she is not at the execution. 
Um, I don't know where she is. She's married. She's maybe had a baby. Uh, you know, maybe she has the baby and then, you know, it grows up a little bit and then dies from something else. We don't, we don't know. Um, but she's not living at court. She's living away from court. And I think at this point, things are looking up for Mary. And I think she's removed herself, which is smart. It makes a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, I don't think she would have. I don't think she would have been there for the execution of her brother or her sister. And I think we can safely assume she knew about their downfall. Yes. Well, this would have been the hot gossip for Mm -hmm. sure. Um, There are no letters to her telling her about this, this particular downfall or asking her to come back to court. That doesn't mean they didn't exist. It just means we don't have them now. Um. So I I don't even know what the motivation would be for her to stay away other than she's been gone for a few years and she just, it's not her place. And maybe she didn't want King Henry to see another Boleyn woman, you know, somebody (laughs) he had had a relationship with. Maybe that would turn out badly for her. Right. Yes. Maybe she's just like, oh, you know what? I can keep my head if I keep my distance. (laughs) Right. Right. Out of sight, out of mind type of a thing. Absolutely. (laughs) So we know that Anne was given a trial, unlike Catherine Howard and Thomas Seymour. Do you believe that her trial was just for show, or do you think that her fate was already determined at that point? Yeah, I think the trial is for show, but the show isn't really about Anne. I think the show is about Henry, because he gave Catherine this really long trial with all these witnesses and this process of the Pope and all of these things. Um, but Anne's downfall is within four months, three, three, maybe. And, um, you know, he's pretty determined to have an expedited process. So I think he gives her this trial because he's already set a precedent for giving a trial to his wives. I think he just kind of has to do it. Um, but, you know, we know he calls people to the stand and we know that there's all these speeches and they're skewed in favor of the king. So I really don't think it was a real trial. She didn't stand a chance. No, I don't think so. If we go back a little, <laughs> I was just thinking about something else, too. Um, prior to her being arrested and everything, um, we often hear the story about Anne pleading to Henry at Greenwich, I think it was, with Elizabeth in her arms. Many believe this to be true, but in fact, I believe Elizabeth wasn't even there at the time. Yeah, there's a really interesting movement um, after Anne's death, uh, and I guess, Well, there's like revisionist history that starts coming out in like 1538, and it lasts for a couple of years. And everyone's trying to kind of revise the public image of Anne Boleyn and actually of Mary Boleyn, too. And I think this story kind of comes out because they're painting her not just as, you know, a fallen queen, but they're trying to humanize her a bit. You know, she was a mother. She was a wife. And even better, she's a Protestant martyr. So I think that this is part of the revisionist history cycle. I'm sure someone wrote about it. But if the documents don't place Elizabeth at court at that time, then this story didn't happen. Right, exactly. And and one of the things about Anne is I feel like she's always known as the one who brought the Protestant religion to England. Yeah. Um, but but really, she she helped maybe guide Henry. I don't know this for certain for certain, but guide him toward reformed religion, not necessarily mm-hmm. Protestant as we know it. But do you know what Mary's view on religion was? Yeah, Mary is absolutely um, on board with the Reformed religion. We have to think about where Anne and Mary spent a lot of their formative years, and that's in France. And French court has women like Queen Claude and Marguerite de Angoulême, who becomes Queen of Navarre. And those two, two women in particular are also going to be supporting Reformed thought. Again, not Protestantism, 
but reforming the church as a necessity. So Anne and Mary are both growing up around these women who throw these ideas around at least as early as 1517, 1518. Um, and then they bring it back to English court. So they're definitely on board with reforming the church. I think Mary doesn't go as far as saying that everyone should be Protestant. But she and her first husband, William Carey, uh, do petition for some some nuns to be elevated into the role of, you know, an abbess at this nunnery. Um, and these are more reformed thinking women that they're advocating for. At the time, Henry says no. But by the time we see Anne coming in, then Anne gets to start advocating for more reformed leaders and he's going to approve those so i think mary is is early she's she's giving him some ideas she's giving him some opportunities but anne is the one who's going to be able to really solidify the switch was mary still alive um, during the reign of queen mary mary was Let's see. Mary died in 1543. So no, oh, no, 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 she wasn't. Okay. My question, of course, was going to be similar to, um, I believe it was, um, was it Catherine Carey or am I thinking of the Knowles family when, um, when Mary came to the throne and mm. was pushing the Catholic and how they had fled? Um, yeah, yeah, there, are, that's a really great, um, tidbit i think a lot of people forget that there's this mass exodus of people who leave england and go to france when catholic mary comes to the throne um one of the people uh, anne's cousin mary howard whom also married um henry fitzroy the mm -hmm. king's illegitimate son so mary howard fitzroy she is definitely protestant She's definitely all about the break from the Catholic Church, which is interesting because the Howards are pretty traditionally Catholic. Right. Um, but Mary Howard, Anne's cousin, is going to be advocating um, for Protestant reform, and then she's going to be patronizing big, big time Protestant authors like John Fox, supporting them when they flee um, under Mary, and then supporting them and publishing their works when they return under Elizabeth the first. So the I, Howards are a big part of this too. <laughs> I, I can't imagine what it would have been like to live during that time. And especially to be a woman during mm -hmm. that time. It seems unimaginable to me. I, I agree. Just the stress. <laughs> exactly. And, the and you know, Yes. Yeah, and, we're, and we're, you know, today we're talking about the execution of Anne Boleyn. And it's such a, a sad day to remember. You know, we look at her, her final speech um, and and just the aftermath of her execution and how maybe it seemed like it didn't take as long as maybe we suspect that people realize that she wasn't guilty. Mm hmm. Yeah, there. Well, and I think there are a couple of things to again, we have to credit Anne with so much because court culture shifted immensely while she was queen or and even at the end of her time as sort of, you know, the girlfriend. Um I mean, we have all these really creative, beautiful manuscripts. There's sort of like this. Think of it as being a middle school. You have like a spiral notebook and you write something in it and then you pass it to the next person and they write something in it. Um, and that's kind of what's happening at Anne's court. We call it the Devonshire Manuscripts. And it's got, you know, entries from Thomas Wyatt and George Boleyn and Mary Howard Fitzroy. And they're writing these poems about being at court, life at court. And it is... It's incredible. So I think this is a weird moment where Anne is going to change court culture and women are going to have a lot, a bigger voice, a lot more agency. Uh, and Protestant reform um, gives women a bigger voice as well. But she falls so quickly 
that when we see the Devonshire manuscript later, the entries after her death, and then you think about, you know, the revisionist history of John Fox and Cardinal Pole and all of those things, people are still talking about Anne, you know, two, four, six years after her death. I think you're right. I think people were really clear that she was innocent by that point. Christine, Thank you so much for coming on the show today and talking to me about the Boleyn sisters. I would love it if you could tell everybody where and how they can find you and your work. Sure. Um, You can find my Facebook page. It's called Untitled History Project. I do videos and blogs, and I'm also doing live blogs and podcasts for the new series, The Spanish Princess on Stars. So you can tune in and listen to me talk about Catherine of Aragon if she's one of those wives that you really wish you had more information about. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. (laughs) This episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast was brought to you in part by The Falcon Nest, handmade history-themed jewelry. The Falcon Nest specializes in gorgeous replicas of that famous Anne Boleyn bee necklace. See more at the-falcon-nest.com. And be sure to remember to use promo code Tudor's Dynasty to receive 15% off. Thanks for checking out the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TudorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening. Thank you for sticking around. It's been a while since I took the moment to thank my patrons. I'd like to start out by thanking Diana E., Bob W., Rachel D., Michelle T., Lacey W., Katie F., Joy B., Debbie V., and Ann L., Mary J., Azaria J., Lara L., Rebecca H., Nora C., Sally Ann F., Jennifer V., Angela A., Sarah C., and Doris C., Cynthia R., Nicole T., Heidi H., Mary T., Lizzie Cheryl T, Adrian S, Carrie H, Sari G, Heather T of the English Renaissance History Podcast, Tanya R, Donna K, Donna F, Catherine R, Courtney D, Sue K, Shelby H, Jen, Melissa S, and Megan B. Thank you so much for being patrons of the show. Your support means more than you'll ever know. If you would like to become a patron of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast, you can do so by going to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty and click become a patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can show your support.